What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today's video, we're going to be making this E46 carbon fiber roof. The process for a roof or almost any car uh, would be almost the exact same. So let's just jump right into it. Enjoy. All right, so this roof, it's a fairly large size, uh, but it is a one piece part. So it is a relatively simple layup. I'll put a tag up here where we did a Corvette hood. It'll be done pretty similar to that video. One of the questions I get a lot is how do I make my molds? All of my molds I make myself. Um, this one is just a basic fiberglass mold. What I ended up doing, I did this back in, shoot, probably 2015-ish time frame. I ended up buying a roof, a steel roof skin. Um, I was doing a lot of body work back then, so I had access to get like body panel parts. So I just bought a roof skin, ended up just pulling a mold off of that rather than having to get like an entire roof from a junkyard off a car and then separate it and all that stuff. In the future, I will be doing some more fiberglass molds off of body panels as well. Um, so if you want to keep up to date with that, go ahead, subscribe. So enough chat, let's just kind of jump right into it.
All right, guys, I'm gonna go over my setup real quick and go over a few things. So first thing to note is how I do my lines. I just take old uh, gallon epoxy things, flip them over so it's kind of like a funnel. The other technique would be like if you ran this line just like into a cup and then you can use like a little clamp to hold it there. Obviously both work. More often than not, I see people use the hose dipped into a cup rather than, you know, this type of setup. So kind of do whatever you kind of feel like, whatever works for you. I had to switch suppliers for my little spiral wrap and the new place does it in millimeter and I guess they do OD where my old stuff was ID. So I was a little bit nervous that this smaller spiral wrap would flow slower, which is kind of the only reason I really put this extra bit in the middle. Under time lapse, you probably saw it, the, the resin front kind of went up faster around this double flow net than the edges. Now the other thing, this one has a pretty typical slant to it. I always double check well, you should double check your gum tape all around anyways. If you have one side that is much slower than the other, you might have a tiny little leak around like one of your pleats or, you know, just press your edges really good. But I think what happens more often than not, if you can focus in on the flow net, up left, the, the individual strands of the red flow net, the up left touches the mold surface while the up right touches the bag surface. And I think the bag surface almost seals the little tiny channels that let the resin flow this way a little bit more. <clears throat> so that's why I'm not worried about it. It looks like it's going good. Keep an eye on my cup because uh, we are getting close-ish to the end. So I double checked everything. We're all good. I have vacuum lines on both corners. Um, so that way if it makes it up if I only had one dead center, you know, it could block the line and then the corner of the mold or, you know, the corner of the part, you know, might lose access to vacuum pressure if you only had one. So that's about it in a nutshell. Uh, we'll jump back to time lapse to uh, finish this thing out. I put a little clock down here. Hopefully it shows up in the camera good enough. Um, we are recording this at 30 times speed. So you can kind of get an idea of how long an infusion this big takes with this setup. Oh, and very last note, this is an epoxy specifically for infusion, which, which just has a lower viscosity than like a regular hand lay epoxy. So that obviously just lets it flow through the part uh, easier. All right guys, so we're just about done. You can see this last corner. Obviously this is real time. It gets pretty slow towards the end. And that's typical when you get towards the end, uh, infusions always slow up. A few notes that people have asked me in previous videos are, you know, why do I infuse uphill? And in, the reason I infuse from bottom to top is air bubbles will always float or stay on top of the resin front. The theory some people have is if you put the epoxy inlet here and vacuum on the bottom, gravity will help pull the epoxy down. But as you're pulling the epoxy down, the res or I'm sorry, the, the air bubbles or you know the air still in the part will want to float up. So that's why I won't say always, because you might have a part that has some sort of shape where part of it goes uphill. There could be some weird case where you do want to infuse downhill, but for the most part, you're always going to want to infuse uphill as much as you can. All right, so looking at it, that corner is pretty much there. It does have a little bit more to go, because uh, this part has about a one inch flange around it, so the trim line is right around these marks and right around here. We're pinched off, but there's enough just like extra in the system. This tube will actually squeeze flat because this is volume in here that will get sucked into the part just to finish up that last little bit. And then as soon as that happens, uh, we'll close the doors and turn the oven on. 
That brings me to my next point. A lot of people ask me how long I cure my parts for or what temperature my oven gets to. If you want to see a video of me building this simple oven, I'll put a tag of it up here as well. To them, I always say, check with the manufacturer of your epoxy. Uh, I guess almost any material that you use making a composite part, the manufacturer of that material, in this case epoxy, they will tell you what properties you'll get from certain cure times and temperatures. Um, so, you know, check with them. They're a much better source than just asking me what I use for my specific epoxy. If you're curious, I went with a extra slow um, mix on this one. So the hardener was 70% slow, 30% fast. Just because one, it's such a large part. And two, the spiral wrap down on the bottom is new to me. Um, and being a little bit smaller than what I've used previously, I didn't know if that would just slow up the infusion, so I, I kind of just slowed down the hardener a little bit, just in case it took too long. Um, also, shop temperature. My shop is um, climate controlled for that reason, but if you're doing this in the summer and your shop's 90 something degrees, you're obviously gonna wanna go slower as well. And then last note, you can see how I now have the epoxy cup high. That's just so I can let the epoxy go down the tube and get this last, I don't know what, 25 grams of epoxy are in this tube before I clamp it down here. If you do do this setup, well even the cup setup, so say this was a cup and it's elevated, you could get a siphoning effect, or in this case just the weight of the epoxy, could just push more epoxy into this line and you'll get what's called ballooning where the epoxy will actually just like pull up and fill up the bag because it flows into the part from its own weight faster than the vacuum can kind of like suck it up the part. So be careful of that as well. All right, so after all that, I just look back and you can see that our corner is pretty much there. Uh, we're gonna close the oven. We obviously gotta take this down because as the door swings, this could poke the part and poke a hole in the bag and then you're just sucking air in through the part. Um, but one thing to note, if you ever do elevated cures on your part, check it. Check your part every, I don't know, five, 10 minutes until it gets up. I have had situations in the past where once this gets warm, you know, a pleat sometimes, especially ones that are hanging like these, could get soft enough where it will kind of like peel down and open up a little airline that wasn't there when you're at room temperature. So just be mindful of that. Um, but yeah, at this point, we're gonna close the oven, cure it, and next scene, I will be pulling this out and demolding it. All right guys, here it is all finished up. At this point, all I gotta do is just wrap it and box it and ship it out. But as you can see, not a very complicated part here. These are available and I'll put a link in the video description below. Also, if you wanna see me installing one of these on an E46 BMW, uh, I'll put a tag up here to that video. That video is actually a couple years old, so it might kinda look a little uh, dated. <laughs> But exactly how I did it several years ago is how I would do it today anyways. So that's about it for this one. If you enjoyed it and you learned something, please consider hitting that subscribe button down below. It really helps me out. As always guys, thanks for hanging out and I'll see you in the next one.